great. Awesome. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to this is Raleigh Latham by Kay Baxter. Uh, seminar today. Uh, everything, um, making sure it's working. Yeah, we got people streaming in, uh, so welcome. For Kay, uh, feel free to. Go. Oh. Uh, there's a question box below, and she will get started with the presentation at any moment. Thanks so much. Jordan, thanks. Have a good time and okay. And welcome to this. We're, um, we're we're getting a few audio errors on your end, okay? Can everyone hear Kay? If you can hear Kay, uh, give me some ones in the in the chat box. Uh, as it is right now, I'm. Uh... Okay, cool. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how I began working with the seeds. Um, so I was very very naive about um, seeds. I guess I um, when I had four young children and when I was in my early or even in my late twenties, early thirties, I had never ever wondered where seeds came from other than that you buy them at the supermarket. So I don't know, it was just something I never thought about. And the thing that got me thinking about seeds was the year of Chernobyl, the Russian um, nuclear disaster. I went to Mystery Creek to the farmer's field days in Hamilton with my mother-in-law on the Kaiwaka Garden Club bus. And I walked into the seed tent and the man in there told me that the only seeds that we could buy in New Zealand that were grown in New Zealand were Pukakaui longkeeper onions and all the rest came from Holland. And I knew at that point that Holland was under a nuclear cloud from the Russian nuclear And I there who'd had to bulldoze the topsoil off their farm. So I knew the situation that was happening over there and I just, this shiver went up my spine and I just knew that, well, it just felt to me like an incredibly powerless position to be in as a mother with four young children, and I didn't like that. And I, I just somehow knew that I wanted to do something about it. And I hadn't what I was going to do. I'd never heard of seed saving. I had already been collecting heritage fruit trees for a while, but I'd never thought about the seeds. You don't find vegetables growing amongst the old fruit trees on the 100-year-old abandoned orchard sites. They don't survive. So... So I went home with this thought, this horrible, uncomfortable feeling of that we were dependent on um, the Northern Hemisphere for our seeds, and nobody really knew that. And um, yeah, and a whole lot of things happened. I don't really want to spend too much time on that journey, but a whole lot of things just kept happening, and the doors kept opening, and somehow I just kept walking through them. And I ended up, um, I ended up. Uh, with a whole lot of people gifting me heritage vegetable seeds. And I started growing them, and I started growing them in my veggie garden at home, and I didn't know anyone else that was saving vegetable seeds. Um, I wasn't connected to any of the international organisations. It was me and my kids in the garden. And so already by then my orchard had kind of changed from fruit trees from the garden centre to um, fruit trees, heritage fruit trees, and I knew I knew those trees all personally, individually. I knew the whakapapa of each tree, and I loved that, and it felt really important, and I was really getting into that. And then all these seeds started coming in, and so very quickly my veggie garden became seeds I could save myself. And so I had this incredible garden, and all these amazing seeds in there, and I started to feel as though something was changing in me that I didn't have any words for. Um, I started to feel as though, whoa, there's something going on here that well, I've never heard anywhere. I've never heard anyone talking about it. I don't know what it, what it really is. But I started to feel as though there was something in the whakapapa. Like when you pick an apple or you pull a carrot up or you pick a lettuce and you know the story of how that seed came to this land and who grew it and how they ate it and it was gifted to me or gifted to you, somehow when you pick it, it that there's some kind of momentary 
point at which it comes it comes through you, the memory of that comes through you, the memory is in, is in us, I felt like it was in me and it somehow knowing the whakapapa of the food I was eating was changing me. And so, so this is not something that happened instantly, like I had 20 years at home in the garden by myself with the kids really before I knew anyone else who was doing this stuff. And I guess the main thing that that gave me at that point was I was realizing that, whoa, there's something more to these heritage food plants than I had ever heard of. And there's something different about them that I had never heard anyone talking about. And I started kind of, it started to come really into my consciousness and I started thinking about it and talking to people about it. And then, um, and then I was, I, I found, this, this was a, um, a poem that was written and sent to me and I have permission to read it. And so I started to connect with other people in the world that were saving seeds and understood their value as I was also coming to understand their value. And this is quite a long poem but I really want to read it because it's so powerful and I, I love it so much. Before you start reading, can you stop for a few seconds so it fits the sound? So now. Just okay, so we've got a little problem with the sound apparently, so they are working on the sound and I'm just yeah. going to... Hey, can, can you start. hear me right now? Yes. Yep, we can hear you. Oh, okay, great. Sorry to interrupt everybody. Um, we just got to fix a little audio issue. That'll make sure that there's no chimes. So, uh, okay, what you're going to do is you're going to click on that audio drop down. Yep. You see, and then there's this little there's this little box that says edit audio options. Edit audio mode. Edit audio mode. Uh, yeah, you're gonna see. There's um, there should be a check box next to play egg, entry exit chimes. You're gonna make that so it's not uh, so it's unchecked. So there's no there's no checks on on any of those. So try to uncheck there so there's nothing, and then you should be good. Sorry, everybody. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> this is just some behind the scenes. You can see the okay? behind the scenes webinar. What's that? Okay, so it's unchecked. It's unchecked. Okay, great. Then you are good to go. Great. Right. Okay. So have, have, have they heard what I've said so far? I, I'll assume so. Okay. Okay, yes. so I'm, I'm going to read you this. Um, really special poem which is called A Manifesto for the Seeds and it's by Woody Woodraska from Aurora Farm in the US and I'm reading it with permission. We are the seed users, seed eaters, seed growers, all of us. We have been wrapped in a world of seed for eons since long before agriculture was thought of. In hunger we ate the birds that ate the seeds. In happy accident we brewed the beer from spoiled and worthless seeds. In unwitting service to the plant, we transported its seeds from place to place on our trouser cuffs. We slobber over ear corn and eat our wheaties. It's in our language. We are of our parents' seed, our ancestors' seed, Adam's seed, ultimately. We are born into, thrive in, die in, a seed-sowing, seed-garnering heritage. To deny sacred status to these capsules of memory and consciousness, these enfoldments of life we call seeds, is to court foolish disaster. We have always known this. But now they're messing with our seeds. The power-grabbing corporations and their government flunkies propose in their arrogance to irradiate, manipulate, defructify, genetically and spiritually violate, monopolize and further disrespect our ancient birthright, our real wealth, seeds. We are strong when we have the seeds. They who would enslave us use as leverage the seeds we cherish. The seeds, we, the seeds that nourish us, what we would pass on to the seventh generation as bride gift, they seize as strategy. They would put a price on the priceless and sell it back to us. Do not let them delude, delude you about their sophisticated seed bank in the high Arctic. Seeds are not preserved by freezing them and locking them away from growers. They are not saved inside mountains and behind bank vault doors. Hide your weapons of mass destruction there, or your bullion if you will, but our seeds hold life which does not thrive in such places. If you would keep a seed forever and increase it, grow it out. Surrender it to soil and warmth and moisture. Wait for the miracle of a plant. Hold the hope of fruition and one seed becomes many, even millions. Then give them away. 
Leave our seeds alone. Leave our seeds in the hands of the people who feed us, the family, the clan, the village. The profession of seedsman was created only 130 years or so ago. Perhaps it was an aberration to try to centralise a process that had before been dispersed in clan and village gardens. Homestead gardens, middens and small fields. Grandmothers and grand uncles collected, watched over, cherished the seeds that came down to them, grew them out with love and patience and infinite care. Grandmother's seeds, grandmother's blessing, passed from generation to generation. Reckon three generations to a century and 150 centuries in the history of agriculture and you have several hundred generations of seed gathering folk. Seed saving grand sisters, passing on with precious seeds to descendants. There is memory, memory encapsulated in this line of life stretching so far back. Feelings are there too. Feelings of gratitude to Gaia, of holding dear, of well wishing to the future. Generations, feelings of faithfulness, feminine feelings. The memory is right there in the seed and in our cells, in the mitochondrial DNA passed down the feminine line. When I touch my seeds, I tap the memory that is there, ancient wisdom almost lost, beaming itself into our consciousness just when it is most needed. John Trudell said, it's about our DNA, descendants, now ancestors. We are the descendants, we are the ancestors. DNA, our DNA, our blood, our flesh and our bone is made up of the metals and the minerals and the liquids of the earth. We are the earth. We truly, literally and figuratively are the earth. Any relationship we will ever have in this world to real power, the real power, not energy systems and other artificial means of authority, but any relationship we will ever have to real power is our relationship to the earth. Seeds are concentrated wealth. Seeds are worth far more than we pay for them now in the nursery or the hardware store. You can pack in a suitcase $10,000 worth of garden seeds in any variety you choose. The slave masters and the propagandists would have us believe that money is power and since they have plenty of money that they are in control. They don't want us to have that suitcase, to be free to leave and plant elsewhere or free to stay and plant many gardens, feed many people with real food. If we are staunchly of the earth, her power is ours to neutralise and tr transmute the evil work of the authority mongers, those without conscience. We can do this with life enhancing actions. Repeat, life affirming actions can override and overwhelm the lifeless. Always the great stone temples of the arrogant become topsoil for living systems. It's something the corporations and the governments fail to appreciate. Their authority rests on entropic processes, explosions, coercions, cultural lies. They cannot take into account the power of life, the connectedness of life. They would have us forget where we come from so we can be entertained and exploited and addicted to their cheap dream, their gadgets and their ersatz food. If we are staunchly of the earth, we have access to the strength of the generations, the ancestry, to help us put life-affirming ideas and actions in the places where death dealing had we can remember from where our power comes. Let us plant gardens, let us plant trees, let us tend cows. Our weapons are our tools, our ammunition is our seeds. Our fuel is the sacred intent to do right by the future of life on the planet. Our marching song is the thrumming of memory in our cells. We march in concert, but we do not march en masse. Our aim is not to dominate, or rather our aim is of service. Each of us has a plot of earth to serve, our own nature spirits and divas to consult, intuition that speaks in us. We know how to surrender to the requirements of the task of plants and soil in order to earn our harvest. We bow to the task in joy and service. Each, each individual one of us mustering pure intent, a gutsy laugh with the power of life upholding us. Join Wendell Berry's Mad Farmers Liberation Front. No Jews, no meetings, you just have to be pissed off enough to be clever. Don't be depressed, be clever. Let us be clear, there is no money in this, only sustenance. This passing forward of DNA on family or clan level is a matter of right livelihood, not of commerce. And right livelihood brings joy. If I can feed myself, my family, a few others perhaps when surplus appears, then I have done something real. I am in touch with my power my delight, and my delight. I'm creating my part of the story. Joy? What if the picture that's been drawn of peasant life is nasty, brutish and short? 
is a cultural con job put out by the rationalists and the materialists, the ones who shortly would have something to sell us. What if life on a subsistence level has joys and satisfactions as well as challenges? What if people had time to laugh and sing? What if there were still people in the world who could catch the memory of this and show it to us? A friend tells me about life in the Philippines. Far back on the rural islands tells how when two rice threshers or donkey drivers meet and begin to talk, they are laughing most of the way through the conversation. There is something boisterously entertaining about what is going on in their poverty-stricken lives. Bennett wrote of an encounter in Africa. Following a lightly trodden path, I came upon a Pasuto village. All the inhabitants were out hoeing mealies. Their ages must have ranged from seven to seventy. And they were singing and hoeing to the rhythm of their own music. As they saw me, they all stopped and stood straight up in surprise. Then with one accord, they began to laugh. I have never heard such laughter. It was pure joy and friendship, without malice and without thought. I joined in and we all laughed together for several minutes and I waved my hand and walked on and they resumed their gravity and their hoeing. This was one of the unforgettable moments in my life. A lifetime's experience has convinced me that happiness is greatest where material prosperity is least. I had seldom seen a happy rich man, but I had seen many happy people among the poorest villages of Asia Minor or Greece. I had seen happiness in Omdurman, but this happiness that I saw before my eyes was beyond all the others. Here was a village totally lacking even the smallest of the benefits of civilization. They had not even a plow or a cart, and yet they were the happiest people I had ever seen. They were without fear and without pride. There they were without fear and without pride. The meek shall inherit the earth, for the meek remember who they are and where their power comes from. Until now, said Mc Terence McKenna, nobody has dropped the ball. Four times the ice has ground down from the north, and four times our ancestors retreated before it. They were cold and wet and miserable. They suffered more than we've ever had than we ever had to. In words to this effect, McKenna honours the ancestry. Our people carried on the story of humans on this earth for all those millennia. Are we going to be the ones to drop the ball? Are we going to wimp our way to our own and the planet's destruction? We say no, enough. That dream of the would-be controllers, that our spirit could be mine to fuel their extravaganza of wastefulness and meanwhile make ourselves complicit by acquiring all the stuff they have to sell, that dream is bankrupt and soulless. We reject it for the fraud it is. So that's a really amazing piece of writing, I think, about seeds. So I guess for me that first 20 years was, was really... Um, Myself building a relationship with the seeds and coming to understand that there are other ways of learning and knowing things than the intellectual way, you know, through science. And it gave me a lot of confidence to continue um, to stand up for the seeds and to speak for the seeds and to to know that to know how the grandmothers and the old people new stuff because they were it was about connections and building relationships and I came to see seeds as being something different than just that packet of seeds that you go and buy in the supermarket when you want to plant something to eat. I guess I came to see seeds as uh, as one of the links in this incredible um, circle of so you plant a seed, you plant it into living soil, which it always was until the last 130 years or so, or even less than that. It was full of the min highly mineralized, loads of microbes, the, the sea grew roots, the roots connected with the earth, communicated with the earth and the soil and the microbes, the leaves communicated with the universe and grew to be the most, the best potential that plant could grow to be. And that nourished us fully and we in turn were able to give back to that environment in, in all sorts of ways, apart from our waste products, but also our thoughts and the energy that we tended the earth with. And there was like a circle going on. And, and so I came to see seeds as being, I mean, without seeds, we can't exist really. It's like they're part of the cycle of life for humans. So seeds either grow food that we eat or they grow food that animals eat, which we eat. So they're a really critical part of that circle. So I came to see them in a, in a, a slightly different light. Um, okay, now I've got to figure out how to turn this. Here we are. 
So one of the things that um, sits with me all the time when I've got a challenge or I'm trying to figure out how to do something is um, Bill Mollison's always not there, not far away. Um, and one of the things that he, one of the sayings that he gave us not long before he died um, was, it's not good enough to be well-intentioned. We must be well-informed. And so I'm thinking about seeds, and it's easy to be well-intentioned, like, you know, reading a poem, reading writing like that one I just read. And um, there are all kind like, you know, there are plenty of us out there that are well-intentioned. We must be well-informed, Bill says. So I'm going to take you through some bits of information, which, um, I mean, I feel like through my intuition and through building a relationship with the seeds, we know that they're important. We know that these we know that these heritage seeds are important. We know that seed saving is important. We know there's a whole lot of stuff we kind of know. But I think that there are a lot of people who don't really understand um, some of the key information that if we did understand it, we might make different decisions. So I'm going to go through... What, what, a her what, what do I mean by a heritage seed? What is a heritage seed? And then talk a little bit about, so what is an open pollinated seed? And what is an F1 hybrid seed? And what is a CMS seed? And what is a GE seed? What, what actually are the differences? Because there's a lot of misinformation in there. And I think this information will really help us to get clear about what the right decisions are and what our next step is. So a heritage seed, A heritage seed, to me, is a seed that has grown in a specific place, it's co-evolved in a specific place on Earth in very strong connection and communication with, with the Earth. And so via the microbes in the Earth, via the life in the soil, via the minerals in the life in the soil, there is strong communication. We know that that happens now. And so that builds a strong plant. The plant, as I mentioned before, is able to connect more strongly with the universe. The, the higher the vibration of the plant, the more electrical energy it has, the more it can pull in from the universe. The higher its ability is to do that. The stronger connection that plant will have with us. And so a heritage seed is a seed that has the potential to grow into a plant that has always been strongly connected to the earth at a specific place and the people that it has always been in relationship with. So, so it has it has grown and co-evolved with specific minerals in the soil, with specific microbes in the soil, with specific climatic conditions, and um, with specific influences from this from the moon and the stars at that place on Earth. And so just as we as humans are a reflection of the earth at the place where we stand, where we live, via the plants and the animals, so are the plants a reflection of, of, of the earth and the, and the universal energies coming in at that place. So the value of a, hum, of a heritage seed comes from the connections, from the communication, from from being something from being a seed we are connected to and a seed that is strongly connected to the environment we live in two two of the most important um, words in the permaculture well if, if you're working within the permaculture framework and involved in doing permaculture design, then the two key words that keep coming up for me all the time is diversity and integration. And so our heritage seeds were the seed, are seeds that contain an enormous diversity of genetic material and are the, that, that have co-evolved in the place where we garden and where we live and that are the most strongly integrated, connected to all the elements of that ecology. So they are, heritage seeds are about resilience, they're about food security, and they're also the seeds, because they have the greater ability to connect with the earth and with the communication and the microbes and all the life in the earth and the universe, they grow to be higher bricks, more nutrient dense, they have um, 
and because of that they're capable of sequestering more carbon and growing soil. So our heritage seeds are essentially an element in the circle of life that is regenerative. Heritage seeds are capable of regenerating humans and the earth. Now I just want to talk a little minute about epigenetics. I'm not a scientist and I'm not a real expert here, but I think it really helps. It's helped me, um, it kind of validates what I'm saying if I need it, which I don't totally think I do, but I think it helps. So there's a new science called epigenetics and it's a, it's a 10 or 20 years old. It's come out of the science of genetics and at the point where scientists came to understand that they could identify and name all, the, all, our, all our bits of DNA, they also came to understand 20 years ago or so that the DNA can't turn itself on and off and they didn't know what did control the genes. So epigenetics is the science that's come out of genetics and epigenetics means what's above the genes or what controls the genes. So you know when we um, when we when we use the word epigenetics, I see in my mind's eye the double helix spiral we've got on the screen there. And so, 20 years or so ago, the scientists didn't understand. Um, they knew that the actual DNA in that double helix spiral was only a, made up only a tiny part of that double helix spiral, and they didn't understand the function of the rest of that double helix spiral. So ironically enough now, they called it the junk DNA. So most of that double helix spiral is made up of what's called the junk DNA. And they didn't know its function then, but we do now. And so the function of that part of our DNA, which was called the junk DNA, we now know that its function is, it's that part of our body that communicates with our food. With not just our food, but at the environment we provide for our body. So that's our food, it's, it's a lot of it can be f food, but it's also the water we drink and the air we breathe and the thoughts we have and the friends we have, the whole environment, stress, the work we do, everything. All of that affects the communication with our junk DNA and places t um, tags on our DNA. So our interaction with our environment, uh, the interaction between our DNA and the environment we live in places tags on our DNA and those tags, if, if the communication has been strong and clear, we'll have strong and clear tags placed on our DNA and so those are the tags on this double helix spiral that are strong and they have not not full of holes. You know, if we are eating high bricks food with high levels of balanced minerals, you know, grown in microbially active and alive soils and really clear, clean water with no chlorine in it and fluorine in it. And, um, and you know, if we are, have work that we love and we've got a good, you know, we're eating the Western price traditional diet, lots of high, um, high levels of traditional fats and oils, you know, um, lots of minerals and vitamins. We're eating good food, we're going to get clear, strong tags placed on our junk DNA. And if we're eating processed food, Food that has um, been homogenized, food that has been pasteurized, food that has been extended, food that's got GE ingredients. For eating food that is un it's not highly mineralized, it's not vibrating at a high level, it's not going to communicate with our junk DNA clearly. So then we see the holy tags, the sort of miscommunication. Holy tags get placed on our junk DNA and then they get placed on our, they send messages to our DNA which determines how our DNA expresses. So the environment we provide determines eventually the messages that get sent to our DNA which determines how our DNA expresses. So, so the quality of the food we eat which is determined by the genetics and the environment, the genetics our food is grown from and from both vegetable seeds, fruit, the fruit trees and the animals and the environment those things are growing in is what determines the quality of the food we eat, which is what determines the way our DNA expresses. So what we're learning in the end all comes back to one thing, it all comes back to 
this in permaculture are the ideas of diversity and integration, but it's really the 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 um, from it comes out of the science of ecology as well, like an understanding that what makes us strong and what makes our ecosystems strong and is is the web of life. It's it's diversity and integration again and again and again. Everywhere we look, it's about diversity and integration. So. If we want to be um, supporting the web of life, I always see it as a blanket. So we've got a multicolored, beautiful, strong, handwoven blanket, you know, from some amazing um, indigenous tribe somewhere on earth where they we, or even like in New Zealand, a beautiful kitty or a beautiful handwoven um, harakeki garment or anything where there are lots and lots of threads in the warp and lots of threads in the weft and they're tightly woven and they're colourful and there's different textures and there's different colours. That is a strong, resilient thing, whatever it is. It's strong and resilient and beautiful and feels good and it supports what's around it. But if we start pulling out any of those threads, it becomes weaker and weaker and weaker and we have less diversity and we have less connectedness, less communication, and less integration. So we're at a crossroads right now on Earth where, we, where we've pulled out so many threads, we've lost so many um, species, they're, they're disappearing every day, our seeds are down to like somewhere between 1 and 5% of what we had, you know, 150 years ago. So we are on a strong path to degeneration. And what this journey of the seeds has got to be all about, it's, it's about more than just the seeds. It's about the seeds are part, we need the seeds to be part of a regenerative way of living. Um, we, know for, we know from the work of, um, of Weston Price and the work he did in the 20s and 30s that indigenous people that were eating traditional food grown from um, their traditional heritage seeds, heritage because they co-evolved in the same place with those people, with the land, with the minerals in that place, were strong, healthy people and the ecologies were really strong and healthy as well. Um, and we know from the work of John Kempf, who if you can Google John, I put that um, connect connection up there so that you can check him out online. He's an amazing originally an Amish farmer, I guess he still is an Amish farmer, but he's now has a company called Advancing Eco Agriculture, and he does lovely um, talks, and he's got lots of webinars and information up there about showing us the evidence and showing how if you plant seeds in soil that is able to fully nourish them, then they have fully functioning immune systems and they're not damaged by pests and diseases and they have their high bricks, they're nutritionally dense, they have complex carbohydrates, they have um, omega-3 and 6, they, they, they sequester traditional fats and oils, they have complete, contain complete proteins and they make essential oils and they are highly functioning plants which then become our food, which means we are more able to becoming highly functioning humans. So these are the seeds, these are the seeds, the heritage seeds that are connected with the land and connected with the universe that are able to, to do this. Okay, so I want to look now at some of the differences between heritage seed and open pollinated seed. So just to recap on what heritage seed is, it's seed that is co-evolved in specific environments with the people, the microbes, the birds, the minerals, they're part of an ecology. The communication, the links, the connections are really strong between all of those elements in the ecology. We know from science now, as if we couldn't tell by taste and by our own bodies, that those heritage plants and the food grown from heritage seeds is far more nutritious, it contains far more nutrition than um, modern seeds, and perhaps most importantly, heritage seeds are capable of regenerating the land that they're grown on. They are also open pollinated seeds, but all heritage seeds are open pollinated. But as we'll see soon, all open pollinated seeds aren't necessarily heritage seeds. Um, okay, so if you want to 
find some there's some good definitions of the difference between heritage seeds and other kinds of seeds on the Seed Savers blog, and that's a link to it there. That's a, a great place to connect up with. Now, the next kind of seed I'm going to talk about, I'm actually going to read this. This is so shocking to me. There's a seed, there's a kind of seed called CMS seeds. Now, CMS seeds are, are actually on our seed packets, they're called F1 hybrids, like but all F1, all F1 hybrids aren't CMS seeds. Um, I'll talk about F1 hybrids in a minute, but this is what CMS seeds are. So lots of this, lots of the food we eat is, is, although the packets say F1 hybrid, and especially our brassicas. I'm really concerned about this because people buying organic brassicas in the health food shops or wherever they're buying them, there's a high potential that these brassicas are actually grown from CMS seeds because if you can't buy organic brassica seed, then, then organic growers are allowed to buy hybrid seed or non-organic seed. So this is a little bit about what CMS seeds actually are. So they're sometimes called hybrid seed from protoplast fusion cytoplasmic male sterility. And they're often nicknamed transgeneric cybrid seed. So essentially they're a biotech revision of a naturally occurring breeding technique that now straddles the border of GE. Cell fusion does not occur naturally. So iPhone rejects them and the biodynamic um, certification process rejects them. But this, the words on the screen, which, uh, oh no, which I actually can't read because I've got this other thing on the screen, so I might just click that. Oh no, no, I need some help from my team in the other room to, um, Sheridan or Tess, can one of you come in here and help me? Um, help me with being able to read this. I've got something over the top of the words. So essentially, um, Okay, oh, how can I shift it? Oh yes, here we go. I'll shift this down here for a bit. Okay, so many of the new hybrid Belgian endive, aka Wickloof chicory varieties, are the result of this type of technique. A cell of a Belgian endive, Chicorium intibus, and a cell of a sunflower, Helianthus anus, are taken and the cell walls are dissolved away with an enzyme. The chicory tells us, uh, the chicory cell has its cyto Plasm, including its mitochondria, irradiated and destroyed, and the sunflower has its cell has its nucleus irradiated away. These two broken cells are then fused together into a single cell with electric shock stimulus or a special chemical. What is left is a new plant cell that is transgeneric, if not transgenic. The cell is then grown in the laboratory into a plant and is then crossed to another plant to make it more likely to survive outdoors. The chicory nucleus and the sunflower mitochondria don't quite like to be in one cell and create a plant that does not produce pollen and can be used to make hybrid seed. This is evolutionary, evolutionarily dubious and in the wild this situation would be evolutionary suicide. So seeds that we buy as F1 seeds, some of them are CMS seeds, and this is actually how they are created. And so when you see people telling you that there's no difference between an F1 hybrid seed, it's just like an, an open pollinated seed, it's just like, you know, it's just seeds that have been crossed naturally, they are not telling the truth. And even the, the ones that aren't CMS seeds, CMS seeds aren't similar to other open pollinated seeds either, as we'll see in a minute. So beware, especially if you're buying brassica seed and it's hybrid seed, it's highly likely to be um, only F1 hybrid and it's highly likely to be CMS because um, there is very little brassica seed left now being grown in the industrial world that isn't CMS because it's the cheapest way to do it and there's the most amount of money involved for the people that are creating that seed. Okay, so well, the other thing about the CMS seed is that if we are if we are trying to find seeds that are going to help us regenerate our health and regenerate the soil and the earth, then it's definitely not going to be CMS seeds because they're terminator seeds essentially. 
as well as that, they are unable to grow to be nutrient dense. They can, they, they're grown in sterile soils. They're like force fed with nitrogen fertilizers. They, they've co evolved in a system in a laboratory which is totally different to the system in, in the natural world where there are lots of connections, there's lots of communication. They're able to pull in from the universe a lot of important um, inputs which help to grow soil and grow health in, in the whole environment. So essentially they're degenerative. They're degenerative seeds and yeah, they're degenerative. Um, F1 hybrids are also described on the Seed Savers blog page. So what is the difference between F1 hybrids that aren't CMS seeds, but they are F1 hybrids, and open pollinated seeds. So they're not the same as open pollinated seeds because open pollinated seeds are seeds that have been grown outdoors in the natural environment and the seeds are, oh, okay, I won't go down that track. I'll talk about what the F1 hybrids are. So they're basically um, created in a laboratory but with a controlled method of pollination by human intervention. Um, and the first generation is very vigorous because of the, the hybrid vigor thing, but the seeds don't grow true and they become way less vigorous in the next generation and we can't, we can't necessarily or usually use them to save seeds from. But the most important critical difference in the end between open pollinated seeds and F1 hybrids is that because they've been, the genetic material is narrowed and narrowed and narrowed in the process of this hybridization in the laboratory by humans to um, concentrate specific genes to make it have a bigger head or a specific, uh, even to be nutrient, in a, to be high, have high levels of specific nutrients perhaps. But in the process of doing that, they lose the genetic diversity. So we lose the resilience, we lose the seeds ability to um, have the next generation of seeds be useful, we lose its ability to potentially um, grow well in a specific environment, we lose a lot of the benefit of the open pollinated heritage seeds in the F1 hybrids. Even though they haven't been genetically engineered, if it's, unless it's a CMS seed which is on the border and they usefully managed to label them as F1 instead of GE. Um, so they are significantly different and also they are also creating a degenerative, they're part of the industrial system of degeneration, of diversity, of the quality of the soils, of the quality of our food, there's less nutrition in them. We know that they contain enzyme blockers which alter the ability of these food plants to pick up essential key minerals from the soil. So for a plant to grow to be nutrient dense, it has to be able to pick up the full range of minerals it needs from the soil from the mic via the microbes. If it does it through um, soluble fertilizer, they don't grow to be nutrient dense because the minerals are taken in in the nitrate form and not the phosphate form. So we get low bricks. Um, Non, it's not nutritious, the food. So F1 hybrids, there's a lot of reasons why they aren't going to be able to create a regenerative system, take care of our health and the soil. Okay, so now the GE seed. I don't think I really need to spend too much time um, telling you why, what the story is about GE seed. Um, there is a lot of new information out there coming out now about um, just how much genetically engineered ingredients are, have infiltrated the food system and how much effect that's having on our health. I think for the first time there is a lot of information being revealed by highly respected scientists and doctors showing us the dangers of genetically engineered food. Um, and I'm, I don't feel like I need to probably go into that. You can go on any website that talks about GMOs and check that out yourself. It obviously is part of the industrial system that degenerates the environment that we live in. There's one aspect of it that is particularly, particularly bad that I do want to talk about because it's a little bit harder to find if you're looking on the internet and it's not well understood generally at the moment. So a lot of our seeds that are being genetically engineered uh, being genetically engineered so that they can be sprayed with Roundup. 
And what I'm going to say, um, this is a slide from one of um, Don Huber's talks, thank you, uh, with permission as well. Um, and it actually not, not only applies to GE seeds, but it also applies to um, soil that has been sprayed with Roundup or a spray with glyphosate in it, or a seed that has been grown in soils that was sprayed with Roundup or was had Roundup in it previously because it translocates to everything. So glyphosate was originally uh, patented in the US as an antibiotic. So without even going any further, without understanding any of how it works and the implications of how it works, we know that it's anti-life. So it's part of the industrial system which degenerates life on Earth, degenerates our ecology, degenerates everything it touches, including our health. And there is an enormous amount of evidence coming out to show, to show that now. But just to cover it briefly, so what happens is if a plant, if a plant is grown in soil that has glyphosate in it, or if it's grown from a seed that has glyphosate in it, or if it's a GE seed or whatever, what happens is the glyphosate translocates to all parts of the plant, to the growing tips, to all the leaves, out through the roots, the root tips into the rhizosphere, which is the living soil around the plant. And so when that plant dies, the glyphosate survives in the soil around the plant and reinfects the next plants that grow. And so if it's a corn plant, it goes into the pollen on the next generation of corn plants and blows somewhere else, so it travels somewhere else. So and in the process, um, so we've got here accumulation of glyphosate in the systemic tissues, the shoots, the reproductive and the roots. So it goes into the seeds, the shoots and the roots. Translocation of glyphosate from the root and the shoot and release into the rhizosphere and the environment. Toxicity to the root tips by glyphosate or its toxic metabolites. So there's a compromise of the plant defense mechanisms and there's a promotion of soil-borne organisms, which mean that the plant has a reduced availability or uptake of essential nutrients. So if we've got glyphosate in the system somehow, once again it means our there's blockers there, which means our plants can't uptake essential nutrients for their health, which means when we eat those plants, there's essential elements missing for our health. So once again, this is another part of the industrial system which degenerates life on Earth. Um, and then there's a whole lot of other, it goes through then to residual soil and residue effects. Um, it affects that, I mean, one of the arguments that the scientists who got this um, GE seeds accepted by um, the FDA was because they said that the humans don't have a shikimati pathway because we know that glyphosate destroys the shikimati, the, the bacterial shikimati pathway which is essential for, um, uh, well that, that's what it does, that's how it kills plants. But now we know that we do have a shikimati pathway in our gut and so we also can see from the science coming through that um, that the, this GE is having a major effect on our gut health. Um, so, and then foliar application of glyphosate, systemic movement through the plant, gelation of micronutrient intensifies stress. So the whole thing just becomes a big cycle of degeneration. Now I don't want to get, I feel like I can't mention that without um, talking a little bit about the positive side of that because a lot of people get extremely um, distressed about the fact that they've had glyphosate in their soil or that they've used Roundup in the past, which I have. Um, and so um, I'll, I'll talk about that at the end, a little bit about what we can do about it, because although there are a lot of people saying there's nothing we can do about it, it's there forever, da da da, I, don't, I totally don't believe that. So what can we do? So we've been a little bit, we've talked about the, the um, qualities of heritage seeds, we've talked about some of the qualities of open pollinated seeds, of um, hybrid seeds, of CMS seeds, and of GE seeds. And we know that the that what we are looking for we are, is health. We are look, our goal, our vision, we're looking for health. We're looking for regeneration. We want to be healthy. We want our kids to be healthy. We know that for that to happen, we have to create healthy soils. We're highly mineralized soils. We need a strong ecology. It's about diversity and integration. 
So if we're really serious about this, we only have one choice if we're looking at seeds, and that is heritage seeds. Uh, but heritage needs to be the seeds of our own land, the seeds of our own ancestors. And I know we can't always be, I mean, actually it means our own seeds, seeds that we've grown and saved ourselves. That's the ultimate ideal, but it's all about small steps. So I don't think we can pretend that hybrid F1 hybrid seeds um, CMS seeds or GE seeds are ever going to meet our needs. Even open pollinated seeds aren't going to ultimately meet our needs. We need heritage seed that is obviously also open pollinated. So let's take this down to some small steps. So we're looking, we're looking for seeds. We want to grow good food that fully nourishes us. We want to generate our ecology and health. We want to take care of our kids. We want to, you know, we, we want to do small steps because that's all we can do. So I think the first step is to recognise that um, seeds don't exist in isolation. That was a real hard one for me, I think, because in the beginning I started like, I want to save these seeds. They feel really important. But then I was, I was granted a Winston Churchill scholarship to study seed saving in America, and this is 15 years ago or more. And I came back from there quite depressed because what I learned from studying with some of the most amazing mentors in America um, was that, um, well, it's kind of what I learned while I was learning what they were showing me. It wasn't actually what they were telling me. But what I saw was that we can't save, we're never going to save the seeds. We can't save the seeds unless we change paradigms. Like, you can't live in the old degenerative paradigm and save seeds. We actually have to take the steps to commit in our lives to living a regenerative lifestyle. We need to be living simply and we need to be planting seeds that is our food from which we save the seeds for the next generation. You can't save seeds separately to that. It's about building connections again. So it's about teaching people to garden again. It's about building communities again. It's about creating strong ecologies. It's about clean water. You actually can't separate seed saving from all of that. And that was like too hard for me at the time. Like how the hell am I going to save the seeds? Like I can't do all of that. So I guess at some point I thought, okay, we start running education programs and we start writing and da da da. So it's all about small steps. So recognising that seeds don't exist in isolation and, it, and they're actually just the same as every other endangered species on the planet, throwing money at it is not going to help. We have to fundamentally change the way we live. We have to join the regeneration revolution. We totally have to join the regeneration revolution and we have to look at everything we do in our lives and go, is this regenerative? Is this choice a regenerative choice or are we damaging someone else's life, someone else's ecology, or even our own ecology in the process. So it's everyone is going to start this journey in a different place, and it's not always about seeds, but it's about making small steps and being very conscious about all our decisions and where we spend our money and how we're living our lives. So we're going to start to make new choices, and it's about working together to learn to garden in regenerative ways. It's about working together to learn about health and not just following the dogma. It's about it's about um, it's just and part of that could be about learning to save seeds. And so you know, it's just like seeds are connected to the soil, to the universe, our bodies, all life on earth just as we are. What we do to one affects the whole. Okay, so what are the small steps we can make? So obviously one of the first small steps we can make is to actually be very conscious about where we get our seeds from. And Koanga is obviously one of the places where that you could choose to buy seeds from that are heritage seeds which have been a large percentage of them have been in this land for more than 100 years and they are connected to this land and to the people of this land in one way or another. So even if they haven't come from your own local bioregion or your own garden or your neighbour's garden, at least this is a start and you can come take it back from there. Um, I mean, the ultimate thing is to be saving our own in highly mineralised, biologically alive environment. 
But there are lots of small steps we can do to create a revolution. So, um, so the first thing is buying the best seed that's available. And the next thing is to choose our own path. Like, so Koanga has, has opened up a lot of pathways and one of them is learn to save seeds. So Koanga essentially exists to inspire and support people to be able to step onto this journey either by saving seeds or by gardening or by learning to grow nutrient dense food or by learning how to eat to maintain our health. Like there are lots of different, people have different specialties and different focuses and different points of stepping on. But essentially we exist to support you on this journey. And we have a lot of material which will support you. And say, learning to save your own seeds is a super critical part of it. Learning to grow nutrient dense food is a really important part of it too. Learning how to garden, learning how to make amazing compost, they're all really important parts of it. Um, but I would really encourage you, uh, um, but I would, well, yeah, I'd really encourage you to like just take small steps, don't be overwhelmed. Check out our website, check out what we, oh, um, ooh, what am I supposed to be doing now? I'm supposed to be clicking um, questions. I think click exit there and click questions here. Help somebody. Oh, okay, so I'm assuming that you can still hear me. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about how you can support us to save the seeds and why you need to, well obviously you can see why because they're such important seeds and they're so endangered. Um, but I just want to talk a little bit about, I'm going to take questions in a minute so you can start um, putting in questions if you have questions. So essentially the Koanga Institute is in a position right now where we have around 800 heritage seeds in our collection. And I've been um, really focused on creating an organisation to save those seeds for a long time. And we have an amazing group of people that are, that are doing this job. Um, however, I can't continue, like some of the, a lot of the, the older people in, seed, in the, film, the movie Seeds, The Untold Story, like we're saying, they don't know what's going to happen because they've got these amazing collections that they're holding and there's no one behind them. So I can't actually step out unless there's enough money to pay people to come in behind me because I'm actually not getting paid. So I really want to make it very clear that I think these seeds are absolutely critical for our future. We have a lot of them here that we can't afford to maintain and the pathway that we've opened up to, to allow other people to help us and support us and be part of the team to save these seeds is through our memberships. So we've recently changed our membership shape so that our memberships are now donations. We're not giving away a lot of the things that we used to give away, although we are still doing a lot of really special things for our members. And one of them is these webinars, which will be filed for people to um, look at later on our members only section of the website. Um, so what we need is 5,000 members to, to give us enough donations to have enough money or enough resources to be able to save all the seeds in our collection. So that is our goal for this year, starting where in about two weeks we're going to um, unleash a really powerful online membership drive. And our goal is to have 5,000 New Zealanders, ordinary people, New Zealanders or anyone, we actually have a lot of really special heritage seed in our collection from other countries, they don't know it yet and maybe one day they'll want it back. So there's plenty of good openings there from people overseas to support us on this journey. Um, so become members, um, become, if you've got enough money, like pay for someone else to have an assisted membership, to let to allow other people who don't have the money in on this journey to start learning and, and educating their families and growing nutrient dense food for their kids and learning about heritage seeds. So yeah, so I'd really, really like to point out and encourage you to become members if you're not already members and to talk to other people about it because right now we are on the edge. We have a lot of seeds which we're putting in the freezer this year all the mother seed because we know we can't afford to grow them out, we haven't got enough garden crew or enough isolation gardens, so we are totally going this year for getting 5,000 members so that we do have enough money at the beginning of the next season to have another garden crew member or two and to have another isolation garden and to do a better job of making more seeds available. So yeah, so I hope you've learned a few things about seed, about um, 
So the difference between heritage seeds and why we might want to take care of our heritage seeds, use heritage seeds, um, get in relationship with our heritage seeds, learn to save seed, and I hope that you'll become part of our team supporting us to save our New Zealand heritage seeds. And I'm open now for questions. If anyone has any questions, um, send them in. Send them in. Um, okay, I'm not. Do you see the questions, Kay? Okay, now what's coming and going? Oh God, I can see. That I haven't. Uh, the um. Are uh, the king seeds, organic seeds, okay? Now that's a tricky question for me to answer. Well, I think you can work that out by what I've already said. So, um, so it depends what you're looking for and what is important to you. So, organic certified organic seeds that are being sold around the world are um, coming from a few growers, mostly in California and in the northern hemisphere, and they're being Grown and certified organic systems, um, I would, I doubt they were regenerative systems because it's easy to be organic and not be regenerative. And um, just because they're organic doesn't mean they're heritage. They could still be F1 hybrids or CMS. And even if they were heritage, can you imagine, like, why would you buy a heritage seed that wasn't connected to you or your land or your environment? Like, these heritage seeds that are being sold around the world now are seeds that are coming out of the multinational corporations because there's money in them. There's money in the words heritage. There's money in the words organic. So everyone's getting onto it. Um, and so they've been in the industrial system now for over 20 years, and they've been grown and selected for industrial systems. Um, and they've been grown and selected in California mostly, which has a 10% humidity, unlike New Zealand, which has like 80 to 90% humidity. So they're not actually useful as heritage seeds for us, unless there's nothing better that you can get. So, I mean, you can sometimes take, do you know what I mean? Like, if we really understand the difference in the importance of connections and aliveness and life and regenerative systems, then... Um, then we need to be looking for seeds that have come, that are organic seeds that have come from our, you know, that, well, I think I've said it. <coughs> Would you run one of your, this is Sue. Hi, Sue. Well, I run one of my workshops in Taranaki, and how many people would need to attend to make it feasible? Um, if you email Trina or email contact at Koanga, we do do workshops around New Zealand occasionally, usually in winter time. Need to like needs to be organised now. In fact, a lot of our work we have a, a group of teachers, and um, we do do workshops during the winter in other places. If we have someone there who's willing to support us with a lot of the details at that end, and it's economically worth it for the Institute. Our focus is on saving the seeds, so we can't afford to like it to cost us because we need to be making money to put into saving the seeds and da-da-da. But if it works, we're open to it. Yeah. Would I be able to use your seeds in Melbourne? Would they be able to enter Australia? Um, I'm sure there are people in Melbourne who already have, there's a lot of amazing stuff happening in Melbourne, and uh, some of our seeds can be sent to Australia, and we have got some amazing seeds here that they maybe don't have over there. Um, but there are there are people in Melbourne, there's a lot of amazing people in Melbourne, and maybe there's a seed saving organisation in Melbourne that you could get seeds from there. Um, I actually think it's really hard in Australia to find seeds that are, organic seeds that have been, and heritage organic seeds that have been grown in Australia. I did some research a couple of years ago, and most of the seed being sold in Australia is um, imported organic heritage seeds from California, just like in New Zealand. So, um, I mean, some I don't know the regulations in Australia. I know that we can't send, we can send anything out of New Zealand. It's whether your immigration will let it in. So you'd have to figure that out. Um, but I would look in Melbourne first, but we do have also some amazing stuff. 
Um, kia ora, Emma. I'm going to join as a member. Can I share this with my Play Centre page and New Zealand Gardeners page? Please try to help you reach your goal. Yes, sure. We'd love people to do that. We're actually, another thing that people can do to support us is with these seeds is on our website, we have a page where we are downloading material that you can print off, like membership brochures and workshop brochures and beautiful posters. Um, you can print it off and put it up. So if you've got like, if you're a naturopath or whatever and you've got a waiting room where people sit, you can support us and your clients by connecting them with us. So there's a lovely page on our website that we're building now for that. And yeah, we really encourage and thank people who are really, really happy to have people working with us in that way. Thanks. So. I don't have a seed house or a cloche. I have been planting in seedling trays by the sliding door and putting them out in the sunshine and bringing them in when it gets cold. All I have is calling the seeds and I am able to grow them just all I have is calling the seeds. Am I able to grow them just as effectively? Do they get a lot of exposure from the time they sprout? Um, I'm not exactly sure what that question means. Um, do they get a lot of exposure from the time they sprout? I mean, if you're growing good seedlings and um, in, in a living seed raising mix and you're getting them out into your garden, well, that's all great. Um, I, I need to understand what you mean by exposure. Maybe you can send in another question and just explain that for me. That'll help me to answer that question. Okay, this is Marin. Um, hi Kay, thank you again for sharing your knowledge. Will I be able to share this webinar on Facebook? This is powerful stuff I would really like to share with my friends. What um, I, I believe what we're going to do is we're going to put this up on our Facebook where you would be able to share it. And then after a couple of weeks, it's going to go on our members only page. So it's going to we're going to get it out there and you will be able to share it. I think we'll probably put it on our website too where everyone can see it for a bit, a couple of weeks, and then so people can share it. But And then after a while, it will go onto our um, onto our members only page. Um, just want to make sure that I've collect, got all the questions. Susan Humphreys, this is from Alia. Susan Humphreys also has excellent explanations, explanations on genetics through her talks on vaccines. Okay, so there's another con a contact, Susan Humphreys. So maybe you can Google that. Yeah, I'm no expert on epigenetics, but I think it's good that I'm not because, because I'm not, I can communicate with ordinary people who haven't got some science. Okay, so that looks like um, that looks like all the questions. So that's that's it for today then. Um, so thanks everyone for listening. Look out for uh, um, the talk on Facebook and you can share it and um, yep, support us in any way you can to help save these seeds because they are really critically endangered and we need people to come. We have got a team of people coming on behind me at Koanga, but we need to have more garden crew and more isolation gardens. And essentially, we can't afford to pay them. So we need more members. 5,000 we're going to go for this year. And we're going to go really hard to do that. And we really see that we, in the end, it's ridiculous for an organisation like Koanga to have to save the seeds for a nation. And I know there are other people out there starting to do it. And that's awesome. But I don't think as a country we're in a position just right yet that we could, the Koanga could drop out and without us losing a lot of critical genetic material. So it's up to all of us, all of you who care, it's up to all of us to together save these seeds. And they will only be saved by all of us working together to do that. And we're really happy for you to be proactive and ask us if we can help you with something or da da da. We'll support you all as much as we can to help get this all out. So thanks very much, everybody. Awesome. Catch you next month at the same time. And we're going to talk about um, compost next month. And we've got an awesome, finally, we've just got an awesome like four-week block coming up after our PDC of workshops, which teach all of this amazing stuff that we are learning at Koanga. You know, how to how to eat a nutrient-dense diet, how to maintain our health, how to re regenerate our bodies, how to food security, how to garden in a way that regenerates the soil and our health, 
how to grow nutrient dense food, tr the tree week, how to um, design forest gardens in a way that means we're regenerating the land, growing amazing, amazing um, food for ourselves there, and urban urban farming. There's all sorts of skills that can be learned, so share it. Actually, we are offering 50. We have a um, special deal at the moment, probably um, only for about a week where we're offering a 50% sponsored, we're actually, Koanga is sponsoring at a 50% of the total cost for um, people heavily involved or connected to community gardens to get these skills out there in community gardens and also for local wairoa and the wider wairoa community people to start to get some of these skills out there into groups of people that haven't really had access to them before. So if you know people in that situation, um, go onto our Facebook page and you can connect up with that. Um, I don't know if it's on our website yet, but I need to check that. But certainly on our Facebook page, a Kuanga Facebook page, there is that deal is up there now and there's a form to fill in if you know anyone who that would work for, like 50% sponsored deal by Kuanga is pretty amazing. Awesome. Catch you later.